after the pouring of the seven bowls of God's wrath and the gathering of the kings of the earth at Armageddon, the book of Revelation now presents another one of the more notable images that has come out of this book of Holy Scriptures, and that is when the angel takes John the seer and shows him the great harlot. And we know that harlot as the whore of Babylon, another image that is speculated upon, discussed, preached, and uh, oftentimes there's great mystery as to who she is and what she represents. The book then goes into great detail as to how she is described and then describes the meaning of those details as the image progresses. The whore is described as very richly dressed, adorned in great wealth, which is seen as the wealth of Rome and the empire that it dominates. Symbolically, the whore is identified as Babylon. And that uh, brings to mind the empire that destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in 587, leading to the great exile in Babylon. The first Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed that first temple. And by the time the book of Revelation has been written, the new Babylon, the Roman Empire, under the leadership of soon-to-be Emperor Titus, the second temple was destroyed. And so Rome is seen very much as the new Babylon. And so the whore of Babylon is a personification of Rome, the mother of harlots and a great abomination on the earth. She's described as being drunk with the blood of the martyrs, again, hearkening to the persecution against Christians that the Roman Empire is undergoing. She's identified by a tattoo of sorts written on her forehead. So her identification is written on her forehead. And that is common form of identification for Roman prostitutes and is consistent with those in the book of Revelation that have been marked with the lamb and the beast on their foreheads. Those who follow the beast are marked on their wrists or their foreheads. Those who follow the lamb have his mark on their foreheads. Here, this common identification for Roman prostitutes is now seen on the whore of Babylon. She is described as riding a great beast. And when you consider that she is a harlot, she is a whore, that term of riding could also have, in many ways, a double meaning, a double entendre of a great promiscuity and harlotry as she's riding the beast. She's committing fornication with this great beast. And so the meaning of these images described in the, are found in the verses following in uh, this further description of the whore of Babylon riding the great beast. Now the scarlet beast is described as having seven heads, ten horns, and is covered with blasphemous names. So it's identified with blasphemy and abomination. This is the power behind the empire that is the great harlot of the earth, the great Roman empire. And the scarlet beast is described as one who existed, no longer exists, and who will come again which hopefully we see in that is a garbled parody for the one who is, who was, and who is to come, that is, the God that is worshipped by the Christians. Here we see the scarlet beast, an image of paganism, as described as one who existed, no longer exists, and who will come again. So in, a, in short, it's a parody on Christ, one who lived and died and who will come again. But it could also be an allusion to the Emperor Nero, who had previously uh, persecuted the church, and the church is now experiencing a persecution again. Now, one has to remember this was not a time of great multimedia or great uh, social networking. We didn't have live broadcasts. Even the telegraph, the radio did not exist. Things were spread by word of mouth. And so perhaps the death of Nero would have only been known for sure within the city of Rome, but outside the city of Rome, in the provinces surrounding and throughout the empire, they only had to count on word of mouth that Nero was in fact dead. And he who had persecuted the church after he blamed them for the uh, burning of Rome, now a new persecution is rising. There could have very well been rumors or traditions that Nero wasn't really dead or that one who was dead has now returned. And so we see all that in the description of one who existed, no longer exists, and who will come again. The scarlet beast is described as having seven heads. And the book of Revelation explains the seven heads stand for seven hills, which is a traditional reference to the city of Rome, which is the power of the great Roman Empire. 
It is also stated in the book of Revelation that the seven heads stands for seven hills, but it also stands for seven kings. Five who have fallen, one still lives. And when you look at the immediate history behind the book of Revelation, you see of the uh, the Caesar dynasty of empires, emperors, we have Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero have all died. And now one, the emperor Domitian, still lives. The Scarlet Beast is also described as having ten horns, which symbolize ten kings who are not yet crowned. Now this could perhaps be again the wishful thinking of the author projecting into the future perhaps referring to the kings of the Parthian Empire to the east of the Roman Empire. We've heard of the Parthians, or at least references to them with the writers of the Apocalypse. Here again, we might be seeing another reference to the Parthian Empire that was a menace on the eastern frontiers of the Roman Empire and perhaps would cause further trouble to this empire that is persecuting the church because the ten horns are later described as turning on the harlot. The ten horns of the beast turn on the harlot and strip her of her riches and devour her flesh, setting her afire. So suddenly is described the fall of the great whore of Babylon. And what does that indicate? It indicates that while the harlot is riding this beast, ultimately the power of the, the harlot, the beast on which she rides, will betray its instrument. In other words, the great evil that is the power behind Rome will betray Rome to harden its authority. And as the book of Revelation describes, this is all according to the plan of God and how he will save his people. The beast will betray its instrument to harden its authority, all according to the plan of God. In other words, God never loses control of what is happening. Persecutions may occur, the people of God may suffer, but God is still in control. God uses these misfortunes and these persecutions as part of his ultimate plan to work out his ultimate triumph over evil. So, the whore of Babylon means Rome, as it states at the very end of that chapter, chapter 17, verse 18. The whore represents that city that is sovereign over all the kings of the earth. So, the fall of the harlot is the fall of Rome. The fall of Babylon and the whore of Babylon is the ultimate fall of Rome that God will bring about. We see that in chapter 14, verse 8, and chapter 16, verse 9, but it is spelled out in much more detail in chapter 17, verse 1 through 19, verse 10. As part of this fall, we see what is also considered to be the lamentation over Babylon which follows the tradition of lamentation that we see throughout the Bible. And we see six scenes of this lamentation, this wailing and this bemoaning of the fall of Babylon, the fall of the great harlot. Well, first there's a declaration by the angel. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And this echoes earlier prophecies that mock the great fall of someone who thought she was beyond defeat, who could not be conquered, but now has fallen. A voice from heaven also declares the fall of Babylon. This is then followed by a lamentation of the kings of the earth. And it's described as the kings of the earth who committed fornication with the whore of Babylon. This would, of course, be symbolic of the kings that were dominated by the Roman Empire and entered into treaty with Rome. So that reference to committing fornication with Babylon would be those kings who entered into treaty with an empire of paganism that sold itself to paganism and persecuted, sought to destroy the holy people of God who worshipped Jesus, who worshipped the Lamb. The next group that bemoans and laments the fall of Babylon are the merchants of the world who sing two songs, bemoaning not only the fall of Babylon, but the markets that they now lose in the collapse of that society, that impending collapse of the society of the Roman Empire. So the merchants of the world sing two songs bemoaning this. And finally, we hear a song of the captains, the navigators, the sailors, and all seafaring men who engaged in this trade with Babylon. 
And the irony of this lamentation accentuates the pathetic and tragic nature of the horror of Babylon. She rides the beast that eventually turns on her, devours her flesh, and sets it afire. And then no one really mourns for Babylon. Instead, the merchants mourn not the loss of Babylon, but the loss of their markets, the money that they would make off of her. The items of great luxury that are described from which they drew their great wealth are now gone. And it states in the book of Revelation, they keep their distance for fear of the punishment inflicted on her. Here we see again a parody of the death of Jesus in which people kept their distance. He was alone on the cross, except in some cases for people who were at the foot of the cross, most of Jesus' disciples fled. Here now we see the great empire of evil that persecuted God's people, betrayed by the very power of its evil, and then the nations of the earth keep their distance as she falls. The image is now of the agent of evil, abandoned by those who sought to profit from dealing with her. And in the end, an announcement in the symbolism of the book of Revelation that dealing with the agents of evil is not profitable, but ends up leading to ruin for those who committed fornication with her, entered into treaty with her, and traded with her. And so this great image of the whore of Babylon is an image of tragedy for those who persecuted the church, the pathetic image of a whore turned on by the beast, lamented not for her, but for the loss of her markets, and in the end, the ultimate triumph of the exact opposite of the whore of Babylon, which we will see portrayed in the wedding feast of the bride of the Lamb.